Welcome to the Air and Harbor Show. I am with Susan Goldberg of National Geographic. Susan, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks, Aaron. I appreciate being here. Well, uh, first of all, uh, to be a Pulitzer Prize winner, I'm very impressed with that. You're editor-in-chief of National Geographic. You're the editorial director of National Geographic Partners. Uh, and you are the first woman to be the editor of That's National true. Geographic. I mean, extraordinary accomplishments, as I said, Previously, I'm kind of in awe of you, so if I, oh, well. if I stumble, please forgive me. <laughs> Don't be in awe. So, um, you know, certainly National Geographic is one of the world's most iconic brands uh, and, and, and known for uh, extraordinary journalistic integrity as well, which you can't say about uh, a lot of publications. I, National Geographic doesn't publish a lot of... Uh, errata, uh, to put it mildly, at least in well, my experience. At, sometimes about um, animals. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, you're forgiven. Uh, you. I used to subscribe when I was a young lad. Well, I'm sorry you don't still subscribe, and maybe I can change your mind. Well, um, well, that's another issue, but I, I, don't, I don't think I still have my collection of like 10,000 magazines. I think I donated those uh, at one point. But I'd be really interested, especially in this era, what, what you see are the the most significant challenges to National Geographic. Um, and I'd also be interested in just the, the whole portfolio now that you know we're a multi-platform society. Oh, absolutely. So I think you hit on a lot of the key points. Uh, National Geographic is 131 years old, right? We began in 1888 as a monthly magazine. Uh, started out as a scientific publication. I was one of your first subscribers. <laughs> well, thank you for that. And, and, and in that case, in our first issue in 1888, you would have read a story about the geological formations around the Potomac River, a total page turner. Wow. But, um, you know, as time went on, we became known for covering the world and everything in it. That's what Alexander Graham Bell wanted us to do. He was our second president. And we really introduced the world to a lot of Americans who at that point in time weren't traveling the way people can travel now. So that's how we really built our reputation. And what is so amazing is we are still covering the world and almost everything in it. You can't really cover the whole world and everything in it. Um, but we're doing it, uh, of course, now across every platform. You know, not only do we have 55 million people reading our magazine in 33 languages every month. But we, we publish multiple magazines. We have magazines that are just on the newsstand. We have a travel magazine. We have a kids' magazine. We have a book division. And then we can start talking about our television channel, the most widely distributed cable channel in 172 languages. And then the really most exciting, to me anyway, part of our enterprise is the digital part. You know, we are growing like Topsy on digital. You know, my impression has always been that Americans, and I love my fellow country persons, as it were, but we're really, compared to people in so many other countries, we're really ignorant about the world, uh, relatively speaking, uh, that we can be very isolated, mm -hmm. very insulated. Uh, and while, you, as you said, uh, travel is easier to do, millions of Americans travel, but Far more Americans never make it out of the country. Talk a little bit about that and how National Geographic, you know, is there a way National Geographic can reach more people who really don't see the rest of the world? Well, I do think that is one of, one of the things that we can do because unlike a lot of media organizations who tell and don't show, we show first and then we also tell. You know, our ability to send photographers and videographers all over the world and literally show people the world has been one of the hallmarks of, of our coverage. Um, it makes an enormous difference, I think, for people to see things, especially when it comes to covering uh, complicated and sometimes difficult topics like climate change. You can't just beat somebody over the head and say, climate change, climate change, you ought to pay attention. You're so much better approaching that story as saying, look at what's happening to this wildlife. Look at what's happening to this landscape. Look at what's happening to these people who can no longer live where they used to live because of climate change. So that's how we're approaching these stories and how we always have. Now, are you doing it, are you approaching on a story-by-story -story basis? Is there a, a, a systemic effort where climate change is a focus? Is there something in every issue or on every program? What's, what's the strategy with climate change so that, you know, is there a more holistic approach? I think on climate, uh, there certainly is a more holistic approach. You know, it's part of really our environmental coverage. That is one of the most important things we cover every single day on nationalgeographic.com. Um, and then if you pick up the magazine or look at it digitally, you will see stories about climate and environment 
pretty much constantly. I don't really know how you could be National Geographic and not be covering what's going on in the environment. And right now, climate is one of the one of the key topics. You know, I always like to say when, when people ask me, what's the position of National Geographic? I always say, on the side of science, on the side of facts, and on the side of the planet. I think that's how we're positioned as a brand. That's a great answer. Tell me about the television platform. So I don't run television. Right. That's the first thing yes. I'm going to tell I'm you. Not, Mike. I'm aware of that, but you're involved. I am involved. Well, we coordinate a lot together. So my colleague Courtney Monroe is the CEO and president of our of our television. You know, it has enormous reach, even larger reach uh, than than what we do in National Geographic Media. But what we really try to do is get together in, um, you know, in in putting all of our resources behind behind topics. So, for example, on um, the subject of, well, let me think of the best example that we've had. They had a great show on Mars. Um, they did a, a scripted series uh, on, on, on going back to Mars. Well, what we did in National Geographic magazine, we looked at Mars, Every all the new research on Mars. We looked at the ability of man to get to Mars, or I should say humankind to get to Mars. You know, when we did yeah, that. Let's not be sexist. Let's not be sexist. And we also did that across our digital platforms because our biggest challenge, and I think it's everybody's challenge in media, is how do you cut through that blizzard of information? So if we together can really push, push and try to break through and break through that clutter, um, we're so much better off. So we're coordinating all the time on these topics. How, you know, one of the challenges in the publication arena is just financially. How is the magazine doing? What's the long-term term strategy to remain viable to be sustainable? Well, I think you hit on it earlier. We are very lucky that we are part of a large portfolio of, of products and, and content put out across platforms. So we can weather a lot of storms that perhaps other folks would struggle more with. You know, that's not to say we don't face the same headwinds that others do in terms of a print publication. I really hate the term legacy media, but, you know, we are, in fact, a legacy brand. What we're trying to do, though, is turn that corner on, on digital publication. Our, our print products are, um, you know, financially profitable, but what we're seeing now is the amazing growth across our digital platforms. Uh, you know, but we have the same challenge everybody else does. So digital is growing fastest, and it makes money, but it doesn't make enough money to cover the cost of doing the kind of reporting, in-depth global reporting, that people expect from National Geographic. You know, so more and more we're leaning into a subscriber model. Um, these are all of the things that everybody is struggling with, and uh, I think we're going to figure it out because we do have so many different ways of telling stories. Uh, to me, the main goal is we've got to be where today's audience is and tell them the stories that on the platforms in which they wish to be informed. All right. Well, I want to talk to you about uh, the press. When we come back, we're going to take a quick break. We will be back with Susan Goldberg in just a moment. For information on how to help promote civil and mutually respectful discourse and support expansion of the distribution of our programs, please email info at harbortv.com. The Rexal Broadcast Through the Year Award recognizes an individual who through leadership, skill, and dedication is advancing the broadcast industry in our state and our nation. Tonight, we honor Aaron Harbor. Aaron has uh, worked extensively in the media as a host, producer, political and economic commentator and columnist. Today, the Aaron Harbor Show is the focus of his media involvement. Aaron, it is a privilege to present you with the Rex Howe Broadcaster of the Year Award. Congratulations. Just make journalism great again. The Aaron Harbour Show may be viewed 24-7 at no charge from any location in the world at harbortv.com. Welcome back to the show. I'm with Susan Goldberg, the editor-in-chief of National Geographic. So, you know, you just touched a little bit on uh, the television partnership and, and the fact that, I mean, you're involved in editorial decisions across all the platforms. What, what other type of collaborations have you done 
with uh, the television side of National Geographic. And I'd be interested if, uh, I don't know how much you can disclose, but you know, looking ahead in the next few years, are there any long-term projects you're excited about? Absolutely. Um, you know, our television side is run by Courtney Monroe, who's the global CEO. Um, you know, we've done things on gender. When we did a, an issue on gender, uh, looking at the role that gender plays in people's lives across the world, television at the same time had a wonderful special around gender done by Katie Couric. When we did an issue about race, Katie Couric, again, had a special on, on the show. Television had a show called Yellowstone Live. We created all kinds of digital content on that. Coming up, we're going to have a special issue on women. Uh, looking at the global state of women in the world, they will do television content in addition. And I think, you know, I can't disclose too much, but as we look at these major topics around the globe, including global environmental challenges, you, can, you will see television and print and digital working in lockstep. All right, that's, uh, I, I can't wait to watch. Good, thank you. So um, you, you have a, an extraordinary background in uh, the media, a, in the press as a journalist. Uh, you're based in Washington, uh, and you've now seen just, uh, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but my, my sense is that we're seeing a phenomenon in just the last few years where the press is being attacked, press is being accused of, of publishing, uh, promulgating fake news, individual journalists are, are being attacked. And it's clear if you look at the survey research, this is having a profound impact on how the American people view journalism, view journalists, view the press. Uh, tell me what your concerns are, if you have concerns, and what you think needs to be done. I have enormous concerns. I mean, the, the undermining of this fundamental leg of democracy concerns me enormously, and I think it should, should concern every American. You know, we are not the enemy of the people. We are the eyes and the ears of the people. And if you take National Geographic specifically, you know, our brand has enormous credibility and great trust. And we do that because, you know, we are incredibly careful about what we do. We are on the side of facts. We are on the side of science. That is just part of our brand identity. And it doesn't matter what platform you're going to read us on. We're going to produce that credible journalism. Now, look, people make mistakes. Journalists do make errors. I think what we've got to do is be um, accountable. We have to be transparent. We have to admit errors, correct them, and then go back to work. But that's always been the case. But we've never seen anything quite like this level of attack on the press. And it really does worry me, um, not as a political matter, but just because if people can't you know, trust what they read, I don't know how people are going to make informed decisions. Um, the one thing we need to do better, well, there's a lot of things we need to do better, but one of the things we need to do better is we need to help people understand how to tell if information is real. You know, it, we're reading a lot about, you know, how videos can be faked, so you can't even tell, and that is very concerning. But often, if you just look at information, you can tell if it's a real story or not a real story. We need to do a much better job of, of helping people understand sourcing and, you know, how to evaluate information. Well, you know, you referenced uh, just the confusion that it causes, and uh, you know, my sense is that people making uh, those statements and attacking the press, their goal is to undermine the credibility of the press. Uh, their goal is to confuse people. Their goal is to make people question the veracity of what they're reading because then it makes it easier for those people attacking the press to make up their own scenarios, their own facts, as it were, uh, and convince people that what they're saying actually uh, is the truth. And soon you have the the phenomenon where people have their own truths, as it were. Well, and, you know, there used to be the expression, you're entitled to your own pin opinion, but not your own facts. And what is very concerning is somehow people seem to feel like there are different sets of facts about the same issues. You know, I guess our reaction is just to double down on fact-based journalism. One of the things that concerns me so much is how science has been politicized. A lot of our reporting is based on science, almost all of it. And you know, when we cover climate change, we're not doing so as a political matter. We're doing so as a science matter. And that is an important part of our coverage. But if people don't believe science and just want to say that's not true, that concerns me a lot. You know, I would, you know, my kind of perspective is, number one, uh, I don't think uh, those of us in journalism do a good job 
of informing our readers, our viewers, our listeners of what we do to get the material that they see. And that this needs to be done on a continuous basis where organizations are showing what's behind the story, what's the effort we made, how many people did we talk to, that you're seeing a uh, you know, 2,000 word uh, article or a 10 minute long segment and it took you know, 500 hours of work or you know, you know, 3,000 pages of review. That's, we don't see the story behind what we present. And in an age where everyone's concerned about attention span, et cetera, we avoid that. And I think that's something that, that press organizations need to start doing. They need to start doing it on a continuous basis as well. Um, you mentioned uh, the idea of, hey, when we make a mistake, we admit it, we do our best to correct it. And you were in that situation in 2018 where you talked about uh, National, National Geographics and how uh, you felt race, racism influenced reporting. Talk a little bit about that and how did you address that? That had to be a huge challenge. Well, this was in connection with the issue that we did on race in April of uh, 2018. That was the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. And we thought it was a good time to step back and take, a, take stock of where this country was on race. And also because the conversation around race in the United States seemed harsher and sharper and just more, um, just nastier than ever. So we decided to do that, and I'm awfully glad we did. But the first thing I thought we needed to do was look at how National Geographic had covered race. Because, you know, as we discussed, we're 131 years old. We were born in 1888, the height of colonialism. And so um, we didn't cover the world then in the ways that we cover the world now. And so what we did was uh, we asked a historian to look at our archives and tell us what he saw about wow. how we covered race. And what he said was really two things. Uh, the first was that up until the time of the Civil Rights Movement, through the 60s, when it came to covering people of color in the United States, well, we really didn't. And we barely mentioned people of color unless they were um, laborers or domestic, domestic servants. And when we went overseas, often we seemed to exoticize people through every kind of cliche, you know, fierce warriors, happy hunters, this kind of thing. Um, now, I think that this has changed a lot in the last, say, 40 to 50 years, um, but I did think it was important to acknowledge what we had done in the past because there is so much of the history of National Geographic that we are so proud of. As we talked about, we showed people the world. We do all kinds of amazing science and research and help make the world, I think, a better place. So we're so proud of that. But there was this other part of our history that I really thought we had to talk about openly. And I wrote this letter to readers. It became one of the best read pieces of content that we've done in the past several years. I think there was um, such interest that, that we would do that. And um, I'm really very gratified by the response. And I would say National Geographic is not alone in this. You've seen similar efforts, for example, at the New York Times, which has gone back in a fascinating project around obituaries, doing obituaries of women and people of color you know, who died years ago who didn't get the obituary that should have been written at the time. So I think there's a lot of this reckoning and taking stock. And you do that so you can move forward in the right way. The, uh, what, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, I, I want to talk about you, kind of your ascendancy and, and you know, how you see yourself as a role model. You're a role model whether you like it or not, and, and, and how do you uh, address that responsibility. So we'll be back with Susan Goldberg in just a moment. For information on how to help promote civil and mutually respectful discourse and support expansion of the distribution of our programs, please email info at harbortv.com. Safely stop fires around your home. Introducing the Fire Ice XT 20 ounce aerosol canister. Fire Ice XT is an eco-friendly water-based fire suppressant gel. Unlike a traditional fire extinguisher, Fire Ice XT is a highly effective, non-toxic firefighting agent that is easy and safe to use around your home, family, and pets. Available at Amazon.com or call 800-924-4874. I'm Aaron Harbour, host of The Aaron Harbour Show. 
Find us on Facebook to get all the latest updates, see behind the scene photos, and make comments and ask me questions. You can see episodes before their TV broadcast, so like the show today. I'm Aaron Harbour, host of The Aaron Harbour Show. I very much would like to hear from you about the program, so please send me an email with your thoughts. You can suggest what topics I should cover, what guests I should invite to be on the show, or even what specific questions you would like me to ask. This is your program, so send your suggestions to Aaron at HarborTV.com. I promise to personally read every one, so email me today. And most of all, thanks for watching. The Aaron Harbour Show may be viewed 24-7 at no charge from any location in the world at HarborTV.com. Welcome back to the show. This is our last segment, unfortunately, with National Geographic Editor-in-Chief, Susan Goldberg. So, um, being the first woman to be editor of uh, the magazine is quite a, an accomplishment, and, and along with your other titles as well. Um, and certainly, whether you like it or not, you're a role model. Um, a lot of people look up to you, including women, and young women, girls. Uh, how do you uh, address that role and, and help people looking up to you? Well, I, you know, that's very nice of you to say, so thank you. Um, I would just say, look, I'm going to be 60 years old this year. I've been a journalist for 40 years, and my career has unfolded on this seam of societal change when women were finally coming into positions of, of authority in newsrooms in, at, at, in numbers and at levels that they really hadn't before. So, you know, that is how my career has, has unfolded. So it's turned out because of that time, I've been the first a lot of times. You know, I was the first female editor at the San Jose Mercury News. I was the first female editor at the Cleveland Plain Dealer. I was the first woman that the Detroit Free Press sent to Lansing to cover the governor and state legislature in 1984. Now, you wouldn't think that it would have been 1984 when that happened. You would have thought that would have been 1934, right? Yeah. But it took until 1984, That's which is amazing. So, you know, I, I feel like I've, I've lived this, and um, what it's ended up making me think more than anything is it'll be a better place. when we'll, we'll live in a better place when I'm not the first anything, when just having a woman in charge is the normal course of doing business. It's nothing exceptional. Nobody will ask about it. People won't write stories about it. Um, and I think that is going to happen in this next generation, and for that, I am truly excited. Well, um, but it's been, you know, obviously an honor and a privilege, and I've been enormously lucky. Well, uh, you've had an extraordinary career. If you, I mean, you, in some of the iconic publications you mentioned, certainly uh, the Plain Dealer in Cleveland, especially uh, the Mercury News, an extraordinary paper. Uh, I used to work a little bit in the Silicon Valley, so that was a newspaper I read every day. Um, when you look back on your career, what, what are a couple highlights that, 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 that you would really like to mention? You know, I, I really do think that going to the legislature in 1984 as a very young woman, I was about um, 20, 24 then, um, and it was terrible. I mean, it was so hard. Not only was I the only woman in our office, but almost all the lawmakers were men. And... I don't know how many state legislatures you've covered, but they're not friendly places, and they're certainly not accepting places of young women. And so when, you know, the whole Me Too movement started, I really, here, now, I thought back to those times, and I thought, wow, you know, that was a whole, like, Me Too life, but none of us either had the guts or the good sense to say, hey, wait a minute, that's wrong, you can't do that. And I am so glad now that, you know, young women wouldn't put up with the kind of garbage that we put up with back then. Uh, so, you know, I think about those early days. I, I must say they did toughen me up quite a bit because um, you just sort of pushed through and got your job done. But it, it, it was really tough. And then, you know, when I sort of fast forward in my career, what I'm really proud of uh, before the days I got to National Geographic were the differences that I felt we could make in communities with local reporting. When I was the editor of The Plain Dealer, we exposed all kinds of corruption in the county government. You know, the result was they voted in all, the voters put a, a whole new cadre of people into office to make Cuyahoga County a better place. I mean, I think it's that kind of reporting that can make a difference. And then now at National Geographic, 
I feel like we have a difference to make the, uh, the ability, excuse me, to make the world a better place. When we expose issues like what's going on with the climate or species uh, that are going extinct, we can, and, or plastic pollution, we can rally people to sol help solve those problems. So that makes me really excited. You know, you mentioned your, your work in the uh, General Assembly uh, in Michigan. You know, I, I'm afraid to say that those kind of conditions uh, persist in many capitals even oh, today. Uh, and one of the problems is it's a function of the imbalance of power, where uh, you may have uh, uh, many more women in office, but even more so many more women in lobbying firms, in newspapers, and that imbalance uh, still exists in terms of power. And I think there, there's still a, a lot of problems. Also, when you were I would guess when you were uh, in the General Assembly working there, not only were members of the General Assembly pretty much all white and male, but probably the newspaper and the, the, the journalism core was too. And some of these guys, I mean, because I interacted with them, some of these guys were, had been doing this for you know, 30, 40, 50 Absolutely. years. Uh, and they were great at it, don't get me wrong. Uh, but Well, I was very lucky. I worked with a great group of of guys, and they all were guys. I did work with a great group of guys. But, you know, people are people, and you work with some great people, and you work with some really tough people, and, and people who are a total pain in the you know what. And it's okay, uh, you know, we got here. But I am really glad that younger women now are just standing up for themselves, and that there's a way for people to do that now. I am very happy to see that. One of the things I'd like to talk about is leadership, and just your take on what, what makes for a great leader. Well, I mean, I've only been in one business, so I can only talk about media leadership, and maybe these, these things are true everywhere. But I think you've got to be able to inspire people around you to, you know, to get excited about what they're doing. You've got to help them do it to the best of their abilities. You've got to listen to what they say. Sometimes you've got to get out of the way. But, you know, a good leader also isn't a pushover. A good leader has to say, actually, I don't think we should do that thing. We really need to do this other thing and help people learn how to be better. Um, I, there, there are a lot of great leaders out there. And um, whenever I get to work with somebody who's a great leader, it's inspiring to me. Uh, my, the person I always think about is my publisher at the Cleveland Plain Dealer, a guy named Terry Egger, who is now the uh, publisher at the Philadelphia Inquirer. He's the best leader that I have ever worked with. He just inspired me every single day. And whenever today I get into a bit of a jam, which happens a lot, um, I think, how would Terry handle this situation? And it helps me see clearly. Do you think, um, as you look at leaders you've known, uh, leaders you respect, or leaders you think about historically, uh, do you think people are born to be great leaders or not? Maybe some people are. I would say, can only speak for myself, that you know, I think I developed as a leader just the way I developed as a writer and then as an editor and then more, more as a leader. You can learn so much along the way. You learn from the people who you worked with who were terrible. You can learn a lot from them too. And then you can learn from the people who set great examples. So I think very few people are actually born to their, you know, born to where they ended up. Most, most of us earned it and uh, learned a lot along the way and made a lot of mistakes along the way. Susan, thank you so much. Oh, thanks so much, Aaron. I appreciate it. You bet. That was Susan Goldberg, Editor-in-Chief of National Geographic. I'm Aaron Harbour. Thanks for watching. Please contact us, we want to hear from you, and thanks for watching.